We are talking today with Anthony Swafford, who is author of the book Jarhead. After you signed your contract, when did you, if ever, start having second thoughts? Well, I mean, I really started having second thoughts the day I landed at boot camp because, yeah, I, uh, you know, you're standing on these yellow footprint, footprints and there are these guys yelling at you and cussing at you and, you know, telling you you're a piece of crap and worthless, and um, which is true, you know, in, in terms of their standards. And it's, uh, it's the beginning of, you know, what I call a temporary psychosis that, that's induced. Uh, it's, you know, it's not normal to want to go kill people and to, to be enthused by uh, say the fact that you can pull a trigger and kill someone a thousand yards away like that's not normal and uh, that's what the Marine Corps induces is that desire and um, so yeah pretty pretty early on I, I was looking around thinking wow this is something that I wasn't expecting like you know the recruiter told me about you know partying in the Philippines and buying hookers but he didn't tell me about this guy yelling in my ear and uh, so, but, but what happens, you know, but, but I was still attached to the idea. I was attached to the romance and I wanted the romance and I wanted to be a Marine. I, I, was, a, I was a young guy. I was, I, I was enthused about it and, and, I, and I stayed and I became, you know, despite myself, uh, you know, retrospectively, despite myself, I, I became a good, a great Marine. I was exactly, there's a, there's a moment in the book that I narrate when the first time that I put on my dress blue uniform and I look at, my, I look at myself in the mirror and I, you know, it's like, well, you know, I'm just like one of their posters. Like, I, I didn't ever expect this, but I am. I, I am this thing called the Marine. The, and, and, and that was um, both troubling and comforting because, because I'd become that thing that they wanted me to become. So prior to going to Iraq and Kuwait, you were stationed at some other places. Yeah, I was. I mean, I you know went through boot camp in San Diego and went through uh, infantry school in uh, North Carolina, and then I was stationed in uh, Southern California at Camp Pendleton for a while. We did a float overseas, which was Okinawa, Korea, and the Philippines, and much debauchery. And then uh, you know we were home for about two months, and and things got hot in in, in Kuwait. So were you looking forward to uh, going to Kuwait and Iraq? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, you know, I was like, like I, I was, um, I was psychotic. You know, I was, I was a young guy and I was a Marine and I was trained to do uh, these horrible deeds and I wanted to do them. Like I wanted to kill people and, and go off and serve my country. And uh, I was excited about that. I was, you know, I was also... Um, f for whatever reason, I was able to, uh, at least I think I was able to retain s some sort of, uh, at least, uh, shadow, shadow self that, that was the me before I joined the Marine Corps. And so I was, um, you know, I was still thinking about what was going on. I wasn't going mindlessly and I'd always been a reader. You know, I wasn't yet a writer, but I was a reader. And so I was inside of my writer's education and, um, I was, I was certainly troubled by it. But I also knew that I was good, that I was a good Marine, and that uh, no matter what, I would do what they told me to do, and and I would do it well. I, I would succeed, and I and in sometimes uh, success in the Marine Corps means death, and I was prepared for that. Within your book, you give us lots of really good insights into both your thinking at these different situations, as well as uh, people in your unit. And one of those early on was talking about uh, a three-day fest of you guys watching videos and drinking and getting kind of pumped up prior to combat. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, we, uh, you know, uh, August 2nd, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Uh, my unit was on call right away. You know, we had our gear packed, and I mean, we already had our gear packed because we were at that point, I, I can't remember the terminology now, but at that point we were like the ready force for the West Coast for, for the 1st Marine Division. So, you know, our, our gear was on, a, on, the, on the parade deck, ready to roll. We didn't know when we were going, but we knew we were going. And we, uh, you know, got new high and tight jarhead haircuts. And a couple guys went out to town and rented a bunch of war movies and bought a lot of beer. And then we sat around our, our rec room uh, drinking beer and watching these films. And, and these films that, you know, that many people assume are anti-war. And that even, in fact, you know, uh, 
after my time in the Marine Corps that I kind of assumed were, were anti-war. But then when I really sat down to think about it, and I thought about me as a as a twenty year old um, sitting preparing to go to war. I was watching these films and they weren't anti-war. They were pro-war. They were part of the romance of, of the military, part of the romance of the Marine Corps. We were watching uh, Apocalypse Now, Platoon. Uh, we were watching Hamburger Hill, uh, The Boys in Company C. And we were, we were watching those films in order to kind of attach ourselves to this narrative, which was fighting, war, and killing, this nastiness that we were trained and prepared to train for and prepare to, you know, perpetuate on the enemy. And, and that was romantic. And, and thus, uh, you know, I, as I say in the book, the men, and, the men who watch these films, who actually know how to use the weapons and kill, are excited by this. So these films are not anti-war. They, they are, in fact, pro-war because they help perpetuate that violence. Yeah, I, th I thought it was really intriguing because uh, you're doing this narrative and you're talking about you're watching this and basically people are chanting about raping, pillaging, and plundering. And at the same time, you talk about how some people um, would quietly disappear for a period of time to go off and cry in anticipation of, you know, the fear of what was coming. Right. I mean, we were afraid. We didn't know what was forthcoming, but we wanted it. And... Um, it didn't matter that we were afraid, certainly afraid of dying. You know, 20, year, 20 years old, you don't want to die. But nonetheless, we were hungry for that experience. The thing that was you know, being narrated on television for us uh, was very soon going to be real and actual, and we were going to be involved fighting, and, and that was attractive, and we still wanted that, no matter, no matter our fear of death. We were young Marines ready to go fight and kill. Talk about that. Um, you're saying the the TV, what was coming across there, and how that affected you. Um, the, the media in this country, they always play it up as you know. Well, we it, very supportive of the troops, you know, and and that uh, I think, and certainly in that war, it was the first time that they started like really putting these uh, red, white, and blue, blue banners behind like every newscast, you know. Um, how did that affect you? Right, I mean, well, you know, um, it affected us not at all. I mean, we were literally, I mean, we were grunts. We were inf the Marine Corps infantry. We were out in the desert. And, you know, once in a while we'd catch a BBC radio. Once in a while someone would go to the rear rear, as we called it, which was way back, and grab a New York Times that was three weeks old or Stars and Stripes or a Washington Post or something. And, you know, we were hungry for that kind of news. But um, yeah, the, 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 the idea that the troops on the ground who are there fighting are affected one way or the other by what's happening in America is really kind of bogus. I mean, um, especially, especially the, the really false and dangerous idea that the troops are negatively affected by uh, dissent, by, by you know, anti-war protests or talk or, or questioning the reason for fighting. Like, we were hungry for that. We wanted to know that, that there was actually some sort of discourse occurring about this, that we weren't just there as fodder that that it, it, because in in the end of discourse there's some meaning and then the most important thing for people who are there fighting possibly dying possibly seeing their friends die is that it, at the end that there's some meaning that they were there for a reason because if they were there for nothing at all if they were there for no reason whatsoever just a wasteful idea a, a, a bankrupt idea then they come back and they're ruined and, and that's really what we see in in vietnam butts who are deeply troubled and and hurt and damaged by that that was a another thing that uh, somewhat surprised me uh, early on in your book you're talking about again prior to combat for you guys and you're uh, talking about both it sounds like in your head as well as amongst your unit about that this war appears to be really about oil you know and you you mentioned Cheney and his connections there and stuff and right. uh, I found that very intriguing yeah I mean we you know it, it, it was a fact that couldn't be ignored I mean we were we were in Saudi Arabia we were a defensive we were in a defensive posture defend you know in defense of Saudi Arabia in defense of the richest oil reserves in the world 
and and you can't separate that from the fact that you're there. And and as well, like we were sitting, we were light infantry in the middle of the desert, saying, and 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 the buzz was Saddam Hussein is uh, massing two hundred thousand troops at the border, and he's coming down. And we're like, well, <laughs> what are we doing here? You know, we're like, you know, a, a few thousand Marines, light infantry, you know, with some Humvees with 50 calibers on top of them. And what, what's going down here? Uh, in fact, retrospectively, that was bogus intelligence, which we're all currently, you know, very aware of, of what happens when bogus intelligence gets out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he wasn't coming down to Saudi Arabia. He had no intention of ever invading Saudi Arabia. He was going into Kuwait because the signals he was getting diplomatically were, uh, we'll kind of shrug, we'll be upset, but we're not going to kick you out. And those were the wrong signals. In uh, knowing knowing that afterwards, um, what's your feelings about that? I mean, there was clearly at the time there was uh, Russian intelligence that said that, you know, he wasn't massing on the borders we were um, presenting in the media and stuff. Um, what's your feelings on that? And what's from other people who served with you, if you ever talked about that, what were their feelings? Well, I mean, you know, we were kind of pissed off, but we, you know, the thing about... Um you know, a Marine Corps grunt is you're very well aware that you're like very at the lowest rung of like the lowest rung of, of uh, action, say, it, it, like and you, you have no political power. You have no no say in what's occurring in, in a larger spectrum. You simply are told to be somewhere and to go fight and maybe die. And that's what you do. But you also, because you're a Marine Corps grunt, you complain a lot and you're pissed off. And, uh, you know, you don't get a shower for 90 days and you stink and everyone stinks and you're angry about that. And you haven't had a hot meal in 40 days. And and also the, the the idea the recognition that you're sitting here defending essentially an a, a absurdly rich oil oil um, oligarchy is problematic and you start complaining about it and you talk about it and, and you're aware of it uh, and and you know sh- sure I mean it's it's interesting that you know. It, morally, the first Gulf War had uh, more more strength behind it in terms of a, a moral action, a just war, than this last one, and, and because you know they were using uh, the fact that Saddam Hussein had invaded a neighboring country, and you can go invade your neighbor, and if you do that, you can expect to be kicked out by other forces, and so uh, there was more justification I, I, in the first Gulf War than this last one. It was, it was absolutely a war of choice, not of necessity. Another uh, quick uh, realization that uh, I liked from the book was when you were talking about you were in uh, a base in the rear that was really nice, an air-conditioned base, and you had the real, sudden realization that this wasn't really a abandoned oil camp. Right, yeah. I mean, there was the, the infrastructure was sitting there. It was waiting. It was ready for 500,000 American troops to descend on Saudi Arabia and go fight a war. It was, and, you know, Retro, you know, uh, uh, my my research while writing, you know, proved that the the you know from the early seventies there were American contractors laying, you know, installing that infrastructure. I mean, you know, no one, people in power knew that at some point knew two things that the Saudi Arabians were our friends, regardless of what they were doing, in terms of you know uh, humanitarian atrocities on their people, and that that was the place where we would mass a large army ready to fight somewhere in the region. It was there waiting for us to land. One of the things that, from reading your book, and a theme that comes up over and over is um, the interplay between you and people back home and how much that is an, an anchor, it seems, for, for keeping your and, and the rest of the unit's sanity, getting letters from parents, uh, friends, and, and primarily the girlfriends seem to be like the thing that really like makes it or breaks it for you guys. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a link that, um, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's a link because you want to be loved and you want to go home and have sex with your girlfriend and you don't want her to be <laughs> sleeping with someone else while you're off uh, about to die. And, um, and also it's something that, that um, you know, they kept... Um, it kept us human. 
uh, because around us there was nothing, you know, it was barbaric. It was machinery that had nothing to do with love or tenderness or softness. It was all hard, metal, death. And the, the, the you know, receiving letters was, you know, a girl drawing roses on the top of the letter. Like that's softness, that's tenderness. And that's something that is human that's much different than uh, sitting behind your sniper rifle and taking shots from a thousand yards out. And so, um, and then that's where you can't always expose that soft side to the guys around you because that might make you weak, but you can expose yourself in those letters. You, you can be exposed when you write and you can kind of let that softness in when you're receiving those letters. And they're, they're, you know, absolutely essential to morale. I mean, guys who, you know, there's a guy who's sitting next to you and he hasn't got a, got a letter in three, he haven't, hasn't received a letter in three weeks. Uh, he's down and out. He's, he's sad. And that's why, you know, there's a guy in my platoon who's writing letters to the women incarcerated at Chowchilla. You know, he got the address from the back of Hustler magazine. And he was after the something, some kind of attachment. And, and, and that, that was just like, because in this world, in this really dark, barbaric place, you know, men need some sort of attachment to something that's that's human and that cares. That uh, brings forth uh, another incident that struck me was talking about that uh, same guy who hadn't gotten any letters, and you s guys started getting this flow of the any marine letters coming in, and I was moved by this one letter that uh, you were talking about that had come in from a 17-year-old girl who was ready to fuck anything, and everybody was getting really excited about that until somebody flipped out the picture and she was so young that it kind of all set you back. Yeah, it was, you know, we realized that um, she was, this, you know, we, reading her letter, she had stepped into this fantasy of ours that was, that was kind of faceless. And then seeing that picture, she was, you know, like someone's little sister or, you know, the neighbor girl that you, that was a couple years behind you in high school. Um, and, and it was kind of, problematic and troubling you know because uh, i think that was like the the confluence of like you know the mary whore kind of you know I, idea of, of a woman and, and we were troubled by it and we didn't really want her inside of that you know whoever she was some girl from indiana who, who sent her picture and wrote a nasty letter to mm. some marine that that she would never know probably to me, it was kind of interesting, too, as because your book is this collection of, of snapshots of you and your unit and, uh, and being Marines, the, the most hardcore you know, people in the military. And you kind of paint this picture and built upon the images that we all have from over time of through the media and stuff that a uh, particular unit is going to be a wide mix of people. And it was just interesting for me to suddenly see like an entire unit that is... Uh, very hardcore, to say the least, in, in most aspects of life and death, to suddenly all be um, silenced, you know, and touched by that. It, it showed this level of, of humanity amongst your whole unit that um, I wasn't expecting. Right. I mean, and, and, you know, that's why I try to narrate in the book is that, you know, in the end, um, the guys around me, um, who, who are more important than me in the book, really. You know, I mean, I'm the, I'm the observer, I'm telling the story, but, um, you know, we're, we're young guys who, who cared, who were loved by people and loved people and really wanted most to, you know, go fight and get the hell out of there and get home and, and, and maybe fix, you know, that, that sort of problematic space that the any Marine letters inhabited, you know, which was, um, the young girl writing this nasty letter like she you know, that like we could be nasty like we could use profane language and, and talk about women in in pretty lewd um lascivious terms but when that was like in our face it, it was um i mean i think it, we realized in, in that moment we realized our crassness really and and that um it wasn't as human as like another letter that was just about care and concern. Talk a little bit about when you finally got into combat. Um, one of your, you'd mentioned earlier that uh, you first ha started having second thoughts as soon as you hit boot camp. Uh, 
when you went into combat in Iraq, did you start um, having second thoughts then too? Well, sure. I mean, you know, every I think every guy sitting on, you know, I mean, the, the really the historic um, what, what's really historic and marks and and what marks the conflict is the fact that. Um, we sat in Saudi Arabia in the region that we were going to fight in you know, for five or six months before actually going to fight. And so we were, you know, the, the morale and the willingness and the desire to go fight and kill and possibly die ebbed and flowed. But, I mean, w you know, we were literally sitting, you know, 100 meters from the border with Iraq between Saudi Arabia and Kuwait had 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 run a few missions across the border but we're waiting for the call on the radio to go get some and and we were you know the the, f the first marine division was like you know in uh in a perimeter waiting for that call and and at that moment you know we, I looked around and I just like oh, what are we doing like we're we're going to go die. We're young. We're like, what the hell am I doing here? Like, you know, I don't want to die. Like, no one wants to die. Um, I may have wanted to kill, but I didn't want to go die. And and that was, you know, part of part of the the recognition or or the the the, the attempt to understand like why it was there and what am I doing? I'm, I'm possibly dying, and you know, I don't want to die. I don't want to see my friend next to me. I don't want to see Atticus die. I don't want to see Troy die. These, these are guys, you know, who I love and who I know. I know them more than I will possibly know anyone. I, I know them deeper than I will possibly know anyone in my entire life. And um, so, yeah, certainly sitting there about to go fight, uh, you know, uh, Diff different emotions. You know, I want to go fight, and I and I want to live. And when you were actually in combat, when you were finally killing Iraqis, um, was that as you had pictured it? Well, the, I mean, the, the 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 it wasn't as I had pictured it. You know, like the practical the practical event of um, calling in fire or pulling a trigger or um, you know what evasive action for artillery or rockets like i knew all of those things but i but regardless you can't be prepared for the the emotional the psychological the metaphysical event of seeing you know being surrounded by corpses uh it, it's uh equal parts uh, fascination and horror at 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 seeing the results of american power and american might and and in fact for us uh, you know, six weeks of bombing probably saved our lives. If on January 19th, rather than uh, six, you, if six weeks of bombing hadn't started, if they'd said, okay, uh, First Marine Division, head north, go fight, we would, have ha we would have suffered many casualties. I probably would have died. The men and many men in my platoon probably would have died because we were at the front of that column. And so there was you know, the recognition that this is horrible, that the people are, you know, there's a guy, there's a corpse there that has no head. Uh, there's a guy there who's dead and has no arms or legs. Uh, horrible, but also, uh, you know, yeah, this saved my life. The, this sort of carnage saved my life. And, and, and so thus, uh, you know, we were thankful for that. In uh, the first uh, Gulf War, most of the U.S. casualties were from friendly fires, my understanding. Well, about 27% were. Oh, okay. Yeah, which was, in fact, the, 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 highest, uh, the, the highest percentage of any war fought in the 20th century. Were you on either end of friendly fire in that? Well, I, I was. My unit was attacked by uh, friendly tanks. Uh, it was about, um, probably about 12... Uh, you know, 12, 16 hours into crossing the border, and we'd, you know, we'd been fired at by enemy artillery, we'd been fired at by enemy rockets, and we were, we'd crossed this pretty enormous minefield uh, safely, and we're on our way toward our ne next objective, and um, a, a task for a marine task force nearby uh, saw us, misidentified us, and started shooting at us with tanks and there you know literally there were tank rounds flying over our heads and we didn't know what was happening we were certain that there were no enemy nearby um 
I, I got on my binoculars, identified them as friendly, and my, my team leader, this guy Johnny, you know, got on the radio and, and ended up stopping the assault and you know, r- winning a medal for it later because of that. But guys, you know, people died. I mean, friendly, friendly you know, Marines died at the hands of other Marines uh, right behind us. Our convoy was hit. And uh, that was actually, you know, as I say in the, in, in the book, that was more horrific than being shot at by the enemy. Like, enemy artillery comes in, you call a fire mission, and you kill them. Enemy rockets come in. Um, we almost engaged them, but didn't, because we were a small unit, and they left. But, but actually, like, have Marines firing on us was horrible. It was just horrific, because we, we knew two things. We knew that we knew how they were trained, and they were trained to kill and desecrate the enemy, and they thought we were the enemy. So they were not going to stop until we were finished and we couldn't fire back. And that was really probably the worst moment of the war was knowing that we were being fired on by our fellows. Talk a bit more about the connection you make with your unit, because that's something that people who have never served really can't fully comprehend the closeness and the tightness of being with people who you're training to kill and die for, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're young guys, and, um, you know, I, I, uh, um, someone once said to me, um, it's kind of like soccer, a soccer team, you know, like you're, you're out there, you're together, and I said, yeah, it was soccer with guns, though, you know, like, and, and it's, it's camaraderie, it's brotherhood, and, um, but, but it's not just those, those, uh, cliches, you know, it's real, it's, it's actual. And, um, because you're you know, literally, I mean, you, you're around these people 24 hours a day. You, you can't, um, go anywhere else. You're around these 18, 24 guys every minute, every second of your life. And you know them like, as I said earlier, like I know those guys like more than I'll probably know anyone else, you know, like, um, you know, I've been married. I knew my wife very well, but I didn't know her. I was not around her 24 hours a day. She went to work. I went to my office to write my book. Different things occurred, and that doesn't happen in the, in the Marine Corps in a small unit, especially when you're deployed for war. And you, you know, you just there, there. You come to this really kind of rich understanding of of each other that that can't be tainted, and it it's. It's not always positive because, you know, you hate this guy because he's a racist or, you know, because he grew up in Alabama and that's what he knows or, or he's, you know, whatever. He's stupid. He's, he, he's ignorant. Uh, maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I'm ignorant from, from his view. But nonetheless, you know, we know and, and love each other. And we, we, one thing that we know more than anything else is like how to go kill people and, how to keep each other safe and so you latch on to each other like that guy next to me that may be an ignorant racist from alabama might save my life and i will save his life and i'll like take that bullet for him which is crazy really because um outside outside of the marine corps we, there was there would be no reason for us to talk on the street there would be no reason for us to be friends or care about one another but because of the intensity of this structure, this thing, combat service, we know each other and, and love each other. And it's this bond, judging from what I've read in the book, it's this bond that continues for life. I mean, uh, a portion of the book is spent kind of tracing different people that were in your unit after the war. Yeah, I, I, you know, I run into a few guys uh, post-war, a few years after the Marine Corps, and... Um, you know, one of those guys is ignorant, is crazy, but, um, and I say that, you know, he's, he's, uh, the last time I see this guy, he's in a bar in Sacramento, wasted out of his head, telling me he's joining the French Foreign Legion the next day. He was kicked out of our platoon before we went into combat, because he, he, we couldn't trust him. He was crazy. The, you know, the one thing the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps wants guys who want to go kill, but the Marine Corps doesn't want guys who are crazy because they'll get other guys killed. So he, he ended up being the, uh, you know, the, 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 the police sergeant, handing out water and shit paper. And, um, and here he was, he was still after that. 
And he was, hey, hey, I'm joining the French Foreign Legion tomorrow. Like, I'm going to Paris. It's costing me a grand. You can do it, too, if you still got it in you, you know, pointing at me. I was like, I, I don't have it in me anymore, man. You know, like, I've been out of the Marine Corps for three or four years. Like, it's not me anymore. Uh, he was still after that thing. And, and um, you know, a, a, another platoon mate of mine who, you know, lived here in Seattle for a while and, and, and kind of cracked up. You know, the last I heard from him, he was literally living in an abandoned bank in Durango, Colorado. Got a call from him. Hey, how you doing, man? All right. Uh, what are you up to? I'm in Durango living in a bank, an abandoned bank. Yeah, he, he'd cracked. Um, but I still cared for him you know, because, because we shared this thing. One of the uh, people you served with who, uh, I wasn't clear exactly when this happened from in the book, but um, Troy, and when you went to his funeral with other people you'd served with. And um, there were some really interesting things in, in that recollection, and one of them was based on a bar fight you guys ended up getting into. Right. And the respect that even though you guys ended up beating the holy crap out of these guys in, in the bar fight, the respect that you had for them versus um, Troy's family in a way. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, Troy, he, he was really... Um you know, uh, my, my closest friend in the platoon, a, a really wonderful guy who, uh, you know, died in a car accident after, after he got out of the Marine Corps. He loved the Marine Corps. He loved being a Marine. Like, the, as I see in the book, like, um, you know, there are many times when I really hated the Marine Corps and I hated the fact of having gone to war, but I would look at Troy and it gave him meaning. Like, having gone overseas and having fought and having served in the, served in the Philippines before that and you know, having gone on patrols against Islamic rebels, like that gave him meaning and he was, he was important and he was big because of it. And he was a good Marine, but you know, he smoked some dope and got busted one time and they wouldn't let him reenlist. It was horrible. He would have been a great Marine. Like he's the guy that the Marine Corps needed. They kicked him out. And, um, you know, he died in a car wreck and we went back to his funeral and, um, yeah, we got in this crazy bar fight and, you know, we were in the bar where he went to drink every night, you know, or maybe every night, maybe every other night, whatever. And, uh, you know, in fact, the bartender there had a drink called a Troy Collier. That was his name. And it was like this insane drink. It was like a pint glass just with liquor and a few ice cubes, basically. And we were dr slamming these things. And, um, you know, we, we got in this huge fight with these locals and tore the place up. Cops pulled us out of there. Uh, you know, said, hey, you know, we know your buddy died and those guys are, those guys are dirt bags or whatever. But when, it, you know, when thinking about it, I, I realized that like those guys who, those guys recognized that Troy had changed. Those guys knew that Troy was no longer a part of this small community in Michigan. And his family wanted to make him still a part of that, you know, because they loved him. They wanted to welcome him back. But the thing was, he couldn't be welcomed back. He was different. He was changed. And those guys who uh, kept him an outsider, who, who didn't allow them back into the circle, understood that. And in, you know, and uh, not knowing it showed him respect and, and showed respect for what he'd been and what he'd endured. So jumping forward to our, our current situation, we've got uh, 100,000 plus troops in Iraq that uh, they're about to rotate some of them out of there. What's your thoughts on, on the current situation? It's like you said before, the first time we we're in the Gulf, there seemed more justification with that situation than there does now. Yeah, I mean, this was a war of choice. So we, you know, we decided that we needed, I mean, certain people decided that we needed to get rid of Saddam Hussein, and, and that happened. Um, uh, you know, when we started bombing on March 19th, I, I felt like it was a horrible mistake. We were going in unilaterally. Uh, we were going into a region that we've really been ignorant about historically in, in terms of what kind of influence we can really have. And, um, you know, uh, I, I did not at all believe that there were weapons of mass destruction uh, because so much intelligence from the first Gulf War was wrong, was bad. You know, there, there were 90 sites that were called um, sites where weapons of mass destruction during the first Gulf War, where, 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 where chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons were either being stored or manufactured. And of those 90 sites, all of which were bombed, 
the the UN team post war discovered that actually one of those ninety sites had any sort of weapon of mass destruction stored in it. So that's how bad the intelligence was. One of ninety targets during the first Gulf War, and I, I knew that there was no way there was no way that it was possible that the intelligence was any better because we didn't. It was a closed society. It was a closed space where we had no no no. There's no reason to believe that we had good intelligence there. There's no reason at all. I mean, we're we were listening. You know, the, the Pentagon was listening to Chilabi, who you know, and 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 all these expats who, of course, are 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 aggrandizing what's happening on the ground there. Certainly, many thousands of people died. Certainly, Iraq is a better place without Saddam Hussein. But the we were sold. The, the war was sold on bogus information, and that was not surprising to me. And it shouldn't be surprising to anyone. I mean, anyone who, who is surprised by that is foolish. Uh, you know, the war was sold. That's, that's what happens. Uh, and, you know, now guys are, the, the, the post-war, you know, I mean, Cheney was saying we'd be out of there by December. I mean, <laughs> did anyone believe that? I mean, uh, again, foolish, foolish people telling lies about about what could be expected on the ground just n- ignoring history every time we've been entangled in the mid east it's been a mess you can't point to one successful diplomatic or military sojourn that that hasn't ended in ended badly and there we are now you know guys are dying at the, at the rate of one every day nearly uh or more and uh, that's going to continue. And, and to think that, you know, I mean, when I die, there will be American troops in Iraq being, being attacked. And there will probably be American troops in Syria and Iran and elsewhere. Because what this, what this action was, was the, the intrusion of American power in the region. And it was a, you know, size 14 boot print in the region. And, okay, we're going to now make something happen here and it's audacious it's it's incredibly audacious and it's ego driven but also it it may actually be it's something that is um retrospectively might might end up being admirable uh, which is i think problematic for many people on the left um it, it might be that 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 democracy does take hold in the region and it might be that um, or certainly it is the case that uh, an Iraq without Saddam Hussein uh, killing hundreds of thousands of people, you know, cutting out a guy's tongue is a better place. And um, th- that doesn't mean you have to agree with why we fought, but it, 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 it's, it's a problematic position, I think, for certainly people on the left, because you're happy that Saddam Hussein's gone, but you're angry about why we went to fight and, and th- that kind of use of power and certainly the unilateral use of power. Do you see any, uh, solutions to, uh, our situation now? Well, I don't, I, I don't know that, uh, I mean, I don't know that a solution is there is available. I, I think that it's going to be a long term entanglement. Um, I mean, we still have huge bases in Japan and, and to think that we're not going to have huge bases in the region, um, and it's totally different. You know, the, the idea that, oh, yeah, we could put a MacArthur stamp, uh, an occupied Japan stamp on Iraq is, again, incredibly foolish. Different war, different people, dif- different, different mindset. Um, uh, you know, Japan was already highly westernized pre-war and, and, and um, uh, you know, a, a different kind of people and a different kind of mentality. And yeah, I mean, I don't really see a solution. I mean, I think that um, God, you know, there will be an American military presence in Iraq. You know, as I said, like when I die, and there will be guys. You know, it'll be it'll be a safer place. But a young Marine will be out on Liberty, walking down the street, and he'll take a bullet in his head. You know, and, th- and that'll happen. You know, a couple times a month, twenty five years from now, that will be occurring there. Because because the 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 hatred for America and for the West is 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 deep there. And we're, you know, there there people are going to be uh, come you know flowing in from Syria and Iran and Jordan and Saudi Arabia just for for, for the opportunity to kill that young Marine on the street. Talk about let's uh, jump to something somewhat different. Uh, talk about writing. How uh, it came to be that uh, you wrote this book. I know you were uh, 
based on reading your book, that you were a scribe in uh, boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the beginning of your writing career? Well, it, it may have been the beginning of my writing career. Um, I mean, I, I was always a reader. I was a I was a loner as a kid, and uh, you know, not very, not very good in school. But I always read, and um, you know, I was I was in the, without knowing it, I was in the midst of my writer's education based on my reading. But um, I didn't have you know the, the the correct influences around me as a kid in, in my family, or you know, I was kind of written off as just like a dumb jock kid. I think you know by by teachers um, who did okay in English. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I didn't have those influences around me, but I left the Marine Corps and, you know, just uh, was still a reader and um, I was lucky enough to run across a, a great professor in, in, at junior college who saw some, some talent in probably a phrase that I'd written because there was no talent anywhere else and, and kind of guided my reading and, and taught me the way that a writer reads, which is different than the way that a reader reads. You know, um, a writer is looking to steal, basically, trying to understand, you know, like, how did Styron write this book? How did Eliot write this poem? What, what makes this thing work? And that's a different kind of reading. And, um, you know, uh, ev uh, eventually, re you know, I realized that uh, maybe I had an inkling of talent and that if I worked hard enough, because, you know, talent is not enough. It's, it's sitting down every day and working and, and, and discipline. Um, and, you know, I hate to state it, but that Marine Corps discipline, in a way, sitting down every day and writing what Frank Conroy, one of my teachers, calls character. Um, you know, he, he has this great moment at the beginning of each year at the writer's workshop where, he, you know, there are 100 people crammed into this horrible room in the university and it's 100 degrees out and 100% humidity in Iowa and you're nervous and, you know, looking around and he says, uh, you know, it takes talent. It takes three things to be a writer, talent and intelligence, and you all have that, but it also takes character, and very few of you have that, he says. And, it's, and he's right, though, and character is sitting down every day and working, and that's, you know, because there are a lot of people with talent and intelligence who try to write, but who don't sit down every day and do the work, and it, it's the people who sit down and work and suffer, and when, when they want to walk away from their typewriter or their pad or their word processor who don't who sit there and work and that's really you know that's how i wrote this book was not getting up from the chair and you know now i'm again you know i'm working on another book and all i am is a guy alone sitting in a room trying to write a book and um you know that's really all that matters and that's when i'm um that's when i'm best you know like that's when i i feel most alive and uh feel like i'm human and and somehow trying to scratch the surface of being and, and, and being a part of the world by making something that, that might survive. You feel that's your calling? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be writing books until I die, you know, and, and I'll be sitting down six or seven days a week and writing a thousand words a day. And uh, many of those words will be bad words, will be the wrong words. Many of those sentences will be uh, horrible. And it's and it's that the 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 character that makes you like recognize that and and, and junk the bad stuff. You know, I mean, I've, you know, I, I junked two hundred pages of a novel before I wrote Jarhead, and I'm I'm in a novel now, and I've gotten rid of fifty pages because they were the wrong pages, and and that's that that's what writing is about: is being um, you know, your own best editor and best critic, and knowing what needs to stay. And, and and getting rid of ego, and and in in the end, just recognizing that, you know, you're sitting alone in a room writing, and no one is no one is there helping you. It's much different. I I, I saw a great jazz show in New York that, a couple of days ago, and I was really envious of these guys because they were up there on stage, and like I know that Wynton Marcellus practices alone in a room, probably many hours a day, but watching him up there on the stage, he had two saxophone players, a a bass player a drummer and a guitar and a pianist with him and he did a solo and they were clapping and nodding their heads and he pulled off and then he was listening to the saxophone player and saying oh yeah yeah and they were like into it and it was this group thing and i was thinking you know there's no one in my room saying that to me when i'm sitting there writing there's no one affirming that and and it, it's it's you know it, it's a different art it's a different craft and um it, it is you know you're you're alone in a room and you're trying to make things work and if you're, you know, for me, most of that, most of the time alone in the room has to do with failure. 
and, and, and the wrong choices and, and somehow making sure that only the things that are correct that need to be there uh, that make the work of art are, are, are left on the page in the end. And you also teach writing now, is that right? I do, yeah. I teach, um, I teach in a um, master's of fine arts program, a writing program in California at St. Mary's College. And um, I taught writing before, as, when I was a grad student. I, I taught writing to undergraduates, and I taught at Lewis and Clark prior. The, the, that wasn't teaching writing. And, um, you know, teaching writing is, is easier than writing, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> because you can look at, at someone's work and, uh, you know, use your blue pen to, to make marks all over the manuscript and talk to them about how to fix this thing. But you, you, yeah, that writer, my student has to go fix the thing. Like I don't have to go, I have to go fix my own manuscript, but the writer has to go fix the thing. I can guide the writer. I can try to understand what, what she's doing on the page and I can tell her like where it's not working, where her logic breaks down or where her aesthetics is just not working. Um, and yeah, that's much easier than <laughs> writing. And and I enjoy it. You know, I mean, I, I like, I mean, I had great people, I had great writers, uh, talk sitting down and spending time with me and looking at my writing and talking to me about it and, and, and helping me become a better writer. And I, I, I relish that opportunity to offer the same. Have you ever tried putting your writing before the students? Not necessarily from, you know, an ego standpoint with your, your uh, current book Jarhead, but maybe with something that you're working on? You know, I, I haven't. Um, I, um, just because I, I, I really want to separate like my teaching from my writing. I mean, it, it's not, I, I can't totally separate it, you know, because I'm, I'm sitting in a class with six or seven students, graduate students, and they've read my book because they're there because they want to study with me. And so they understand my book. And, but I, I just try to like, I'm happy to talk to students about my book, like after class over a beer or a cup of coffee, but I didn't want it to like enter the classroom because, because it's, it's not important in the classroom. Um, how I write, uh, what I understand about writing is important, but not the specifics of like my text. And you know, they would probably, if I offered them a manuscript, would tear it apart. So. <laughs> um, do you interact with people via email that are uh, interested in your book and your writing? Yeah, I mean, if, if someone drops me an email, I, I certainly try to, you know, s re respond to them. Um, you know, you, I, I was reading here in Seattle last night, a young guy, a uh, young Marine, who just got back from Iraq, he's finishing his degree at, uh, at, U, at, at UW, was um, you know, telling me that he's working, that he's writing about his experience in Iraq, and he's writing about war, and I said, well, here's my email, and, you know, drop me a line if you want me to read some pages or, or, or talk to you about something, so... Um, you know, I try to make my I try to make myself as available as, as I possibly can. Um, I'm way behind on responding to many letters. You know, I got I got a great letter from a guy in prison, and um, w w which I need to respond to. I mean, he really, yeah, it, it's probably the best letter that I received from someone, uh, a reader, uh, saying, you know, a great catalog of 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 um, similarities between Marine Corps life and incarcerated life, and. Uh, yeah, you know, that's a letter that I'm really tardy on responding to. Yeah, it's probably kind of hard because you're in crunch time with working on your novel, so. Yeah, I am, and, and um, but, but I, you know, I think there's, I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that someone tracks down my email address and drops me a line, you know, and if they just say, hey, man, I liked your book, and then, you know, I'll respond, hey, thanks, yeah. That's good, because that's the technique I use to dig up some uh, interviews. <laughs> Um, and it sounds like a lot of the techniques you use on writing actually in the discipline there would actually apply to more than just writing. I was thinking when you were giving your examples and stuff that that applies to putting, you know, a radio show together. Sure. Yeah. Just like, um, you know, again, character and character is about um, doing what's expected of you and, and like finishing it. And, you know, and this is not to disparage people, but, you know, I mean, I know people who are a couple of years late on books and you know, I can't imagine being a couple of years late on a book. If I've sold it um, and, and a publisher is expecting it, I'm, I'm going to write the book. You know, like if, if KEXP expects a show from you, like you get the show done. Like at 10 a.m. on Sunday, they can't have dead air, right? Um, and, and that's what it's about. You know, like 
pr- producing something and and working hard and making sure that it's there and that it's that it's of quality. You know, like doing you know writing. When I sent my manuscript of Jarhead off, my final draft, like I knew that I'd written the best book that I could possibly have written. And you know, there are a few sentences in there that I change now. A couple sentences that I get rid of. And when I do readings, I cut a sentence here, cut a sentence there, change a word. But when I sent that off on May twentieth, two thousand two, like I knew that I'd written the best book that I possibly could have, that I'd spent so much time inside of the book, inside of every sentence, that I knew every sentence in the book, and that that my publisher was getting the best thing that I possibly could have produced. But still, don't you see where there might be situations, let's use your current book as an example, where uh, a time constraint isn't necessarily going to deliver the best product. You know, you're getting six months before your deadline and you suddenly have this, you know, epiphany that you really need to redo something that you're not going to be able to make in that time. Don't you really have more of a um, uh, duty to follow through with whatever amount of time it takes to bring forth that book sure i mean your duty is to the art before it's to your publisher you know like if if i if i had to uh, you know turn a book on book in on x date and it wasn't going to be the best book possible on x date then i would say you know i need another six months or i need another year like i understand that but i guess i just don't like I don't know, you know, writers are lazy. You know, like I'm lazy, writers are lazy. Radio guys are probably lazy too, right? Because, <laughs> you know, it's an easy job. I mean, it's, it's not an easy job, but it's, you know, you make your own schedule, there's no one barking at you, you wake up in the morning, have some coffee, put on your slippers, read the newspaper. Now, I don't start writing till two or three in the afternoon. Sometimes I don't start writing till nine at night because I put it off all day and go see a movie, whatever. And, and um, but in the end of the day, I write those thousand words, you know, and, and if, if it's at 3 a.m. that I finish, then it's at 3 a.m. And um, I, I just, you know, I, 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 and it's the jarhead in me, I guess, in a way, like I, I admire work ethic. And I know that, uh, you know, again, like talent and intellect only take you so far, like hard work gets a thing finished. Hard work makes a piece of art, not talent, not simply talent and intellect. All right. Any uh, last words you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, I can't think of anything. Okay. Except uh, please go out and get high and tight haircuts. They're very attractive. Very good. We've just been talking with Anthony Swafford, who is author of Jarhead and uh, forthcoming novel we can expect from you. Uh, sometime in 2005. Very good. All right. Well, thanks for spending time with us today. Hey, thank you.